where you will in the southeast, the central south, the southwest, and considerable portions of the Midwest as well as the west. And you will find that intercollegiate athletics dominates the academic scene. Its pervasive evident, its pervasiveness is clearly evident in the recruitment process. Seniors who have excelled in high school in, say, basketball or football are courted by dozens of colleges that offer incredible inducements to sign on and wear the crimson or the blue or the royal purple or the red tie or whatever. <laughs> the distraction of the young athlete as he works toward the successful completion of his secondary school education is massive. By now, in late November or early December, the suspense is over. Over for the colleges, that is. The high school athlete has made his decision, at which time he rides to a press conference in a new convertible automobile <laughs> and makes his announcement. He says that upon reflection, <laughs> <laughs> and after due consideration of all factors, <laughs> he has decided to play for the Royal Pulp Purple, in the colors of the college that is the favorite of his high school coach, his mother and his father, his sisters and his brothers, his aunts and his cousins. <laughs> Meanwhile, back in high school, the valedictorian <laughs> and other high school, other high school high scholastic achievers await the decision of, on their applications for admission to college. And unless they request an early decision, a risky ploy at best, they have, to, they have a long wait until late March or early April. They are the ones who are in suspense, not the colleges, which, which have already recruited their athletes. And as one reflects on this situation, one wonders what the colleges are all about. The young, the young athlete who was so vigorously recruited may now have a few problems of his own. As a freshman, his principal orientation is with the coaches, athletic director, and the other players. He must practice long hours and study the strategy and the plays for additional hours in the evening. Small wonder that he was, lighter, he was advised to take a lighter course, handball 101, <laughs> and to postpone the more, the more demanding courses. While the perquisites are considerable, they do not provide more hours in the day for rest or for study, and they make no promises about the future. If he dreams of fame and fortune in professional sports, the chances that he will make it are less than one in a hundred. And if he is black, there's a 90% chance that he will play out his el eligibility and never graduate from high school, from college. If he is black, the chances are that he and other blacks will constitute 50 to 60% of the players on the varsity team, while the black population of that same college will rarely, if ever, reach 10%. This is big business, and the task of training our young people in the arts and sciences of the professions seem relatively unimportant in the eyes of those who are shaping the money tree. Now, the biggest money tree of all is the television money, television money tree that grows not in Brooklyn, but in Manhattan. <laughs> a few days ago, one of the television networks signed a contract with the NCAA for a billion dollars, a billion dollars to televise uh, the games for the next seven, seven years. That network, network thereby becomes one of the most powerful forces in higher education more powerful than boards of trustees, more powerful than university professors, of course, and even more powerful than the alumni and the boosters who chip in a few hundred million dollars of their own to sweeten the cup for athletics at their favorite institutions. And the mad scramble is on to get the players who can move the teams up near the top where the billion dollars are being doled out to institutions. It is a monstrous spectacle unworthy of institutions that are supposed to be in the business of advancing learning and perpetuating it to posterity. 
those who founded our colleges and universities intended that their primary function was to discover and advance knowledge, cultivate the minds, and improve the sensibilities of the men and women who were willing to join the enterprise of higher education. They fully intended that the colleges and universities should be the vehicles for preparing leaders in the arts, the sciences, and the professions. They also intended that the institutions they founded be the training ground for a healthy, responsible citizenship, fully capable of confronting problems near and far, and participating in their resolution. I do not believe that the founders of our educational institutions intended that they should be centers for sports that prosper because they beguile people into preferring one brand of cereal, one brand of automobile, or one brand of aftershave lotion over another. Our institutions of higher education deserve a better image than of being regarded primarily as huge centers of entertainment as one distinguished ed ed educator dubbed them. If they performed the functions that they were indeed intended to perform, they would be in the front ranks of institutions committed to the intellectual and social improvement of our society. 